All right, so I'm going to try to stay with my current system that I have where I'm trying to do, I'm going to doing morning prayer, one book of Proverbs, and one small book of the Bible. Um, that way, there's plenty of content. That way, if something happens and I end up having to take off or get tied up with something, you guys have got some stuff to, some, some stuff to watch and some meat and potatoes to chew on. So... We've done Jude and Obadiah. Now we're going to do Philemon. And it's one chapter. It's one of those little bitty books. You just you look at it and it's like, oh, it's one chapter. You keep on reading. I'm going to get into some real stuff. But what's surprising is, is how much information, how much little details are hidden within these small books. And it really begs to us to take the time to look and to read in them and to take and, and extract those little bits of information, those little details. So Philemon 1, <coughs> a greeting, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer, to the beloved Aphia, a, a Crippus, our Crippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith which you have towards the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake I'd rather appeal to you, being such a one as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner, of Jesus Christ. I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. I am sending him back. You therefore receive him, that is, my own heart, whom I wish to keep with me, that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. But without your consent I wanted to do nothing, that your good deed might not be the, by compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. So, so far, we're up to verse 14. So far, what are you hearing here? Because these books aren't in here by accident. And you think, well, one chapter, you know, what, what possibly could it have, have told us? And, you know, upon just a cursory reading of Philemon 1, you're like, okay, well, he's just talking to him and, and telling him what's going on. But when we dig deeper into this and look from a spiritual standpoint at what God is, why did God put this book in the Bible? Now we have to look at what he's trying to teach us. Well, first of all, he's given us an example of how we are to interact with each other. I mean, look at how much they're, they're caring for each other and, and respecting each other and things like that. So he's showing us, this is how I want you guys to be with each other. Pay attention to what's going on with, with your brother and your sister and help each other and be there for each other. Because we're all a family. So now look what he, look what he teaches here. And this is what, like what I've told you guys before about giving your gifts and your tithe. What's your driving force behind it? Now, verse 14, but without your consent, I wanted to do nothing. That your good deed might not be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. Now, like I've said, a lot of people give tithes. They'll write big checks. I'm going to give 10%. And they throw it in there. But in their heart, they feel like this is my duty. I need to do this as a Christian. But where is your actual, what's your actual driving force behind it? Are you doing it because you love God and you love your fellow man you want to help? Are you doing it because you love your church and you want to see them prosper and grow? What is your driving force behind the things that you do? And this means a lot. Because if you smile and tell somebody good morning, but in your heart you can't stand that person, you hate them with everything you got. Did it mean anything? No, there's no love there. But if you smile, even though if you don't care for the person, you smile and you say good morning because you love your fellow man. You love your brother or sister in Christ or you love your coworker, And you know that that's going to help them in that day. You're thinking about their feelings. It's going to help them be in a better mood. There's a different driving force behind that. And this is what he's take, talking about here. That your good deed might not be by compulsion. You might not feel like you're, you're owed it or you must do this by duty. He wants you to voluntarily do it. For perhaps, verse 15, for perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord? If then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would me. So he's saying, look, we're all the same. 
if you would do the for me, do the same for this one. I'm giving you my seal of approval on this on this guy. But if he was wronged, if he has wronged you, or owes you anything, put that on my account. So he's taking, he's bearing his brother's burden. You see all the teachings that Jesus gave; it's all hidden within here. Um, so put it, whatever he did, but put it on my account. I'll de I'll deal with it. I'm bearing each other's burden. Uh, I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay. Not to mention to you that you owe me even your own self besides. Now, that was interesting that he said that there. Uh, is it, was it Paul that led him to Christ? Probably. And he does. He owes him. You led me to, you led me to salvation. I do owe you one. But that's what Paul was like. No, no, I want you to do it because you want to do it. I don't want you to do it because you owe me one. But if there's anything between you and him i'll deal with it and you have my you have my my seal of my yes my yes will be yes yes brother let me have joy from you in the lord refresh my heart in the lord having confidence in your obedience i write to you knowing that you will do even more than i say so he's letting him know about how his, he has i have confidence in you i know you're going to do this but meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be granted to you. <coughs> Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Now, you know, if you just read through this book, it doesn't catch anything. But look at what we were able to pull out of there. And there's more. But look at what we were able to pull out. It's other teachings of Jesus. It's also painting a picture of look at how they're interacting with each other and how they're dealing with each other and how they're treating each other. And we see today, especially on YouTube, but everywhere, uh, Christians getting this, getting on their moral high horse and saying, oh, but you don't do this? Well, you're not saved. Well, you, oh, you don't have tongues? You're not saved. Oh, you taught them that they don't have to repent to be saved? Oh, you're a heretic, you're a false teacher, you're a false prophet. Well, the Bible doesn't say you have to repent to be saved. You repent because you're saved. Now, you can give me, there. there's one scripture that says repent and be baptized and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I think there's one other that says uh, repent to be saved. But go look at what he's actually meaning there. Because if you must repent to be saved, Jesus and God both would say it. And they don't. They say believe. The repentance comes as a result of that salvation. Once the Holy Spirit indwells in you, you cannot help but change. You cannot be in close proximity to God without changing. So the, the desire to repent will come upon you. You'll be convicted and you'll do that. Now, a lot of people misuse this word. Again, they go in there and they say, oh, you need to repent. Repent of what? Repent of your sins. What do you mean by repent? You need to confess them and tell God. Those are two different things. Confession and repentance are two different things. Repentance is I'm looking at my life that I have now, and I'm looking at the life I'm about to partake of in Christ. I'm now going to change my direction and go that way. I'm now going to change my mind. I don't want this anymore. I want this. I'm now going to turn and go towards God. I'm not going to take the, keep going on the life that I was going before. That's repentance. If a person just repents, if they just turn and go following after God, are they saved? No. There's no faith. You have to believe first. Everything comes from your belief. You believe, then these things happen. And it, people constantly get this mixed up. It is a process that you go through after you believe and you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Then the Holy Spirit sits there and goes, okay, I need to change that, I need to change that, I need to change that, I need to fix this. Oh, we got to get this dealt with. Then the Holy Spirit says, all right, let me get that heart and convict it so we can get this started. Let's get this process started. And then the rest of your life, even the apostles admitted to this, the rest of your life is spent getting this stuff dealt with. So, these little books in the Bible have so much in them, so much depth in, in their meaning. You just got to go find it. You just got to look for it. Because if, if this is the inspired word of God, and he made this to happen, and he preserves his word, why would he put something in there that doesn't mean anything? Did he, do it as a, did he set it up like that to be a filler? No. There's meaning in here. We found a few of them.
And the more you dig into it and the more you look and the more you, the more you go at it as I want to learn, not what can I use. I want to learn. The spirit starts to open all these things up to you. Because it's real easy for us to go and find whatever we want in here and use it against our brothers and sisters. But if we take what we find in here and use it to help everyone understand, to help our brothers and sisters, to point them to things. So it's really important to read, 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 to take the time. Sometimes it's boring, but it depends on where you're coming from. What are you looking to achieve? Are you looking to achieve a better knowledge and understanding of God? Or are you just looking to say, well, let, let me look so I can memorize it, and then I can you know, quote, quote it to other people. No. It's not going to do you any good. You can quote scripture all day long, but if there's no love behind it, if there's no Holy Spirit there driving it, it's not going to bring you anything. So keep reading, guys, uh, and let's go through these books together. But don't forget to check out the other playlists. Love y'all. Bless you in Jesus' name. I'll see you in the next one.